Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you and welcome to the latest in our series of Doha debates sponsored by the Qatar Foundation. To many in the Middle East, no issue is as controversial and emotive as the one we're discussing tonight. The right of return by Palestinians to lands and property that once belonged to them in what is now Israel. Palestinian leaders say they won't renounce that right. Moreover, it's enshrined in four separate bodies of international law. Israelis say they can't accept such a proposition. It would lead simply to the destruction of the Jewish state. Well, our motion tonight seeks to elicit the arguments from both sides. This House believes the Palestinians should give up their full right of return. Speaking for the motion, Bassem Eid, founder and director of the Palestinian Human Rights Monitoring Group. He's worked in the human rights field for many years, documenting abuses by both Palestinians and Israelis. He's lived in refugee camps for over 40 years and is now resident of the Akbat Jabba camp in Jericho. With him, Yossi Balin, member of the Israeli parliament, the Knesset. He served as a minister in several governments, and in 2003, he helped to bring about the signing of the Geneva Accord, a private peace agreement negotiated by Palestinian and Israeli experts that was never officially recognized by either government. Against the motion, Ilan Pape, senior lecturer of political science at Haifa University. Two years ago, he supported a boycott of Israeli universities, saying that external pressure on Israel was the best means of ending the occupation. He's written a number of books on Middle Eastern affairs, including the making of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Also against the motion, Ali Abu Nima. He's the son of Palestinian refugees. He grew up in Europe and now lives in Ireland and the United States, where he founded the Electronic Intifada, an internet gateway about the Palestinians and their conflict with Israel. He lectures frequently at colleges in the US and is the author of a recent book called One Country, a proposal to end the Israeli-Palestinian impasse. Ladies and gentlemen, our panel. And now let me call on Bassem Eid, first of all, to speak for the motion. As you know, I am uh, a refugee, still living in a refugee camp in the past 40 years. The daily life in a refugee camp is a so miserable one. Sewage is bumping inside the narrow streets. A shortage of electricity and water is exist. And our children, including my children, are developing on the sewage in that street. So for how long I am as a Palestinian and my children and the other Palestinian children can suffer from a such kind of situation? I think that we almost reach the time that we should have to find a solution. And if by giving up with the right of return, let me do it, because the most important thing for me today and for most of the Palestinians is that the Palestinian state is going to see the light. Now, we are suffering. For how long we can suffer? In the past 60 years, we are the Palestinians, especially the refugees in the occupied territories, continue sacrificing ourselves for the right of return. It is the time right now to see the Palestinian refugees in some other places, like in Jordan, like in Syria, like in Lebanon, making their own intifada and start fighting for the right of return. I think that we become today out of any kind of energy, and it is the time right now to give us a kind of a rest. Basami, thank you very much indeed. You paint a picture of misery of people who have absolutely nothing in the refugee camps, and yet you would take away their last principle, or what many regard as their last principle, the right of return. Then you would have them with nothing at all. Why? Listen, sometimes you might have a kind of a dream which might be applicable on the ground. But I think that in the past 60 years we are it's dreaming. It's more than a dream. They believe in it. But for how long you can dream if there are some Palestinians who might be able to wait for another 60 years or 120 more years to suffer for the right of return, let them do it and please come to the courtyard and still fight for that. And what do you really think the Palestinians will get in return for giving up the right of return? What, what, what are you saying to them? Do this and everything will be fine. Give I, up your dream and everything will be fine. I think that and then give is, up another one and another one and another one all the way along the line. I think if the international community almost failed to find a solution for the Palestinian refugees, 
It is the time for the international community right now to start practicing a kind of pressure on the Arab countries where these refugees are exist to start recognizing them as citizens, to allow them to work in these countries, to allow these people to give them the freedom of movement, then I believe that that might be the best solution in terms to reach a kind of a solution with the Israeli conflict and to see the Palestinian independent state is delivering with its capital, East Jerusalem. All right, Basami, thank you very much indeed. Now could I call on Elan Pape, please, to speak against the motion? Yes, I would like to argue strongly against the motion. Firstly, because of my personal history. My parents are German Jews who were kicked out of Germany and most of their relatives were killed in the Holocaust. Because of that personal history, I strongly support any struggle against oppression, dispossession, and colonization like the one that has inf been inflicted on the Palestinians in the past and in the present. Secondly, I believe that by acknowledging the right of return, Israel will acknowledge the ethnic cleansing it perpetrated against the Palestinians in 1948 when it dispossessed half of Palestine's population, demolished half of Palestine's villages, and destroyed half of Palestine's towns. This ethnic cleansing is the cause and the root of the problem. Thirdly, I believe that by acknowledging the right of return, Israel would be transformed from a racist and ethnic state into a democratic state, where the principle of one person, one vote, would be the basis for the state and not the ethnicity and the religion of the person. Finally, I think, if we look at the peace process and the peace efforts ever since the creation of the State of Israel, all these efforts had failed because of the attempt to bypass the right of return which is acknowledged by the United Nations and to bypass the refugee issues. Therefore, all the peace attempts so far had produced more bloodshed and more hostility. To sum up, I would say that by accepting the right of return as the basis for a comprehensive solution in Palestine, we can bring peace and reconciliation to Palestine, stability to the Middle East, and also significantly improve the relationship between the West and the Arab and Islamic world. Well, I'm Pape. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. How long do you want the Palestinians to go on fighting and dying for? Another 50 years, another 100 years, another 500 years. When will it be enough for you to fight for this right of return? I think that the moment that the world would say to Israel, enough is enough, we no, it's tolerate. But it's been over 50 years already. And no, I think what, what, there what are is under, your deadline I here? think there are under very important undercurrents in the West, even in the United States, even among Jewish communities, where people say to Israel, enough is enough. And that's the only way to stop the suffering of but the But you know your country well. You know that they are never going to give in That's to the right I... to return. Up to five million refugees. Do you think they're really going to open the door for five million no, Palestinians? No, I don't think refugees? they will even end the occupation if you leave it to them. I think you need the world to pressure Israel as it pressured South Africa. Also, the whites in South Africa did not want to give up the apartheid system. And you needed outside pressure. Israel doesn't have forces from But it wasn't the outside him. pressure that ended South Together, Africa. There was, it was a very important component in the process that eventually led to the end of apartheid. And what has it achieved for the Palestinians hanging on to this dream year after year after well, year? It have they, have they got, has it brought them peace? Has it brought them prosperity? No, it hasn't brought them Has it brought peace. them happiness? No, it brought... Aren't these dreams worth fighting for as well? It's not a dream. It's Why not? A, a it is a dream for no, those people who are living in the misery that Basamid was yes, describing a, the other day. Every, it's a dream. Every people who live under oppression fight for the end of oppression. You can call it a dream, but you can also call it a natural and human impulse to but end But my point is misery. this. Isn't peace just as legitimate a dream as the right of return? But there will be And that no right of return is standing in the way of a peace treaty. On the contrary. Peace will never be achieved until the Israelis acknowledge the dispossession and until they will acknowledge the continued dispossession. The right of return... There are some Palestinian leaders who are prepared to give up the right of unfortunately, return. Unfortunately. But I do think that it is very important to understand that there is an ideological infrastructure of the Jewish state that wants as much of Palestine as possible with as few Palestinians in it as possible. 
and this is the core of the problem. And the people themselves in Israel cannot understand it until the world, and especially the Western world, sends them a message in the 21st century, a country that subscribes to such an ideology is unacceptable. All right. Okay. Very much like South Africa. Thank you very, very, much. Happy. Thank you Thank very you. much indeed. Now let me call please on Yossi Balin to speak for the motion. Ladies and gentlemen, I made all the way to talk to you in order to explain that we are not speaking about a zero-sum game, that somebody has to forget about the right of return or to implement it immediately. There won't be peace without a solution for the, for the refugee problem, a solution which is dignified, a solution which is fair, a solution which is agreed upon by both sides. And this is, by the way, said by the Arab Initiative, which is debated today in the Arab uh, Summit. There is no Israeli partner from the right or from the left who is going to agree that there will be both a Palestinian state based on the 67 borders, and side by side there will be an Israel with a Palestinian majority, which is the implementation of the right of return. It will not happen. So people can speak about it and say easily, well, let them continue and fight for it, but it will not be implemented in Israel. And this is why I believe that when you speak about a solution, you must speak, when you speak about a compromise, you must speak about a solution. And I want to, to end by saying the following thing. There are dreams on both sides. Israelis dream about the greater Israel, about Jerusalem united, about sovereignty on the Temple Mount, which is Haram Sharif. But they know that eventually Haram Sharif will be under Palestinian sovereignty if they want peace. And the same goes for the Palestinians who know that sometimes you use the right of return just to provoke Israelis and say, you must give it to us, knowing that if you speak about the right of return, there is no compromise and there is no peace. The role of the politicians is not to kill these dreams. People may go on and dream. The role of the, of the politicians is to prevent these dreams from becoming nightmares. And this is what we are trying to do. Yossi Balin, thank you very much. Put yourself in the position of the Palestinians for a moment. No free movement, no secure tenure, no right to work, no right even to get the taxes that are paid to them back from Israel. And you want them to give up this as well and to trust the state of Israel, which has gone on expanding its settlements, which are deemed illegal by Britain and many other countries, and you want them to trust the Israelis and say, okay, just reject this right of return and everything will be well. It's only, why, should, why should they do it? It's only in the context of a package. The Israelis will not give up on the... Well, they don't see it as the context of a package. It's a sacred right to many of them. Okay, so it's don't give up on right. What I'm telling you is don't, you don't have to give up on it. I mean, both sides are entitled to their own dreams. And I think that the peace treaty has nothing to do with dreams. The question is whether we can put an end to the suffering of the two peoples terrorism and, and uh, expulsion and whatever we did to each other, or whether we want to live in our situation to continue it, to continue bickering, to continue hate each other and, and provoke the, each other. This is what we have done in the last 60 years. But what and can you, you know, say to persuade the, the Palestinians? You know that every concession they've made, you couldn't negotiate with Arab, Yasser Arafat because he wasn't a partner, so you said have democratic government. You can't negotiate with a democratic government because you don't like them either, so give up the right of return. It's one concession you're demanding after another. You know, Why should they do it, Yossi Balin? Why should they? Why are your it, rights as an Israeli more important than theirs then, as a I'm, Palestinian? I'm not, I'm not saying it. What I can say is that both sides are having their own books against each other, and the Israeli government will give you a book 
about the breaching of the agreement by the Palestinians, and vice versa. So I, I want to put an end to it. I hate the situation whereby there, there is a visitor coming to us, be, be it Tony Blair or the American president. He comes to us, we are giving him all the details about how the Palestinians breached the agreements. Then they go to Ramallah, and then they, the Palestinians are giving him, giving him all the, the details about how Israel breached the agreement. And what he, you know, some of them, at least one of them, said to me, you know what, you are right, and you are right, I don't come back to the region. And I don't want the world to give up on us, because if this happens, we may give up on ourselves. We right. have to put a solution for it. Yossi Bailey, thank you very much indeed. Let me please ask Ali Abu Nima to speak against the motion. I strongly oppose this motion, and I want to tell you why. It's very personal for me, but it's also a matter of principle. My mother was, uh, with her entire family and like millions of other Palestinians, forced to leave her home and her village in 1948 in what is now Israel. What strikes me is all the four panelists here tonight, we are from the same country. But what distinguishes us is that whereas uh, Yossi Balin can live in the country freely, uh, his relatives can come, anybody who the State of Israel considers Jewish can come and live in the country, visit, buy an apartment by the sea. My own mother, born in the country, has no right even to visit. If my mother was a black African and Yossi Balin was a white Africana, everybody would understand what that is. That's why President Jimmy Carter calls it apartheid. The reality today is that in this country there are 11 million people who live under one government. I know the news goes on about a Palestinian government, but it's a fictional government because it has no control over the checkpoints, the borders, the settlements, the water, anything. There is one government in Israel-Palestine. It's the Israeli government, and it's a Jewish sectarian government. And our challenge today is to transform a Jewish sectarian government into a government for all the people who live in Israel-Palestine. I strongly believe that Israelis and Palestinians can live together in peace and justice, just like blacks and whites in South Africa, just like nationalists and unionists in Northern Ireland, but only on the basis of full equality and dignity for every human being. Ali Abu Nima, thank you very much indeed. Ali Abu Nima, why stick to a right that, although many Palestinians hold dear, the majority probably wouldn't want to exercise? The majority of Jews in the world You don't have, want to go and live in what is now Israel? The majority, the majority of Jews in the world have no desire to live in the no, state of Israel. No, I'm asking about the Palestinians. Well, I'm saying, so why does Israel insist on a discriminatory law that allows but, any no, Jew but to please, live. please answer the question as it relates to it's the Palestinians. It's a question of why, human rights. Why go hanging on to a right that they don't want to exercise? Many of them do. Some don't. It's a matter no, of choice. A, a lot don't. In a survey in 1993, only 10% wanted to go back in annual quotas. Well, those surveys are, are not accurate. One of the consistent well, what is the accurate point, figure then? Well, Palestinians have never been given the choice. Let's give them the choice and see how many. Well, they've been asked their opinions. Well, and, and the world don't, don't be, want to go. And yet, they elected, yet you want them to hang on to this for the sake of a principle. Tim, don't you want them to have peace? Palestinians in the occupied territories elected a government that strongly upholds the right of return. They made a choice, and Tony Blair, the European Union, the United States, all decided to boycott the Palestinians and starve them to death because they exercised that choice. You don't even want the two-state solution that the main Palestinian leadership is pushing for. I believe, that underpins their entire policy. Well, it's a so fair... So you're that out of tune with Palestinian not, thinking? Not at all. What Palestinians want is equality and democracy. And everywhere I go uh, and speak to Palestinians about this, they say to me, it's not about a state, it's about our rights. And they say, we want to live in peace with Israelis, but the Israelis want to live in peace with us. And frankly, Tim, the evidence is not strong that they do. Ali Abu Nima, thank you very much indeed. All right, lady in the first row. There. Mr. Balin, 
You spoke of a solution. I was just wondering at the top of your head what that solution might be. I am the person with the solution. I'm not asking others to give me solutions. And I hate formulas which are hollow. I mean, to have a two-state solution and peace, it is nothing for me. Or a fair solution for the Palestinian refugees. What is the solution? The Geneva Initiative is the only detailed solution which exists. Nothing like this, what was offered before by Israelis and Palestinians, and nothing like that has been offered later, later on, which means something. Fascinating. Yeah, I think that uh, the audience also must have to understand one thing. And I'm a person who believes what the American people are saying. If you are living in a hole, stop digging. So I am living in the hole. And I must have to stop digging. I believe that nobody of you is living in a hole so you can continue digging. I think that the Palestinians knows exactly what is going on inside their daily life. I think that the Palestinians almost sacrificed themselves in the past over than 60 years. And I think that it is still an internal decision, mainly not even for the Palestinian leaders, but All also right. for the Palestinian refugees, which okay. according to the surveys, only 10% of them would love right. to Basically. come back to Palestine. Okay, thank so, you very much. We're going to take another question here. Lady in the third row. Why should the majority of Palestinians concede their right to an identity and a homeland in order to maintain the notion of an exclusive Jewish state? Let Basemid answer that. I think that we, the Palestinians today, are totally fed up, so hopeless and so angry on the international community and probably mainly on our own people that nobody is trying until now, since the Oslo Accord has been signed in 93, nobody succeed to improve the daily life of the Palestinians. Right, let's, let's, nobody will believe that before Oslo, our life has been much more better than it is today. Basamid, let's have Ali Abu Nima come in on that. Well, I want to get to that question, but I just wonder if apartheid would have ended if Nelson Mandela had taken the approach that Basim Eid takes, the one of giving in to racism, giving in to colonialism. But the question, <laughs> the question, should Palestinians give up their rights so that Israel can be a Jewish supremacist state? The answer, of course, is no, they shouldn't. Does that mean Israelis, as a community, as individuals, as a culture, don't have the right to live in peace and security? Of course they do. What Israelis say they want in this region is acceptance and legitimacy, just like whites in South Africa. Whites in South Africa could not get that through 300 years of fighting, of domination, of oppression, of dispossession. Today, white South Africans travel throughout the world. They live in their country with no problem. Why? Because they gave up the notion that God gave them a right to have special and better rights than everybody else. All right. <laughs> Gentlemen in the first row. My question to uh, this side is, um, you've mentioned South Africa before, and we've, we know that it, it took a radical change to change things over. What do you propose as something solid, something concrete, something that I could see as an individual? Can you answer that? Yes, I would like to That's answer that. I, I think that uh, the struggle against apartheid in South Africa is very inspirational for anyone who supports the Palestinian cause because it created an anti-apartheid movement in Europe, a solidarity movement in Europe that eventually brought pressure from the outside on the South African regime. I think this is a very concrete program to recruit the people in the West to turn Israel into a pariah state as long as it continues its criminal policies. Yeah, this but how does this bear on the right of return, the South African It, it does. How? I, I'll tell how you does. exactly how it bears. The one system that eventually worked in South Africa was one person, one vote. People who were expelled, people who were put in Bantustans, people who were exiled they were the from majority. the country. They were the people who have the right. They were the majority. But these are the indigenous people of Palestine. We are, we, they are not immigrants that Israelis ask to give them right. These are people who were expelled, dispossessed, not only in 1948, but ever since 1948. 
the return of the Jews was justified in the eyes of the world after 2,000 years. Why cannot the return of the Palestinian after 60 years be an exception? Let me just take Basami and then I'll come back. Basami. Yeah, just a short comment to my colleague uh, Abu Neme, that Abu Neme is living in Chicago and he's moving between Chicago and Dublin. He is not living in a refugee camp, and I wish that Mr. Abu Neme one day will come probably to replace me in Akbe Jaber in Jericho for one probably month, and I would love to replace you in Chicago in terms to see which kind of fertilities and, people and your, have and in their daily is, life. And your point is what? And my ben point is that we know ourselves much more than any other Palestinian who is living outside, which he has no connection to the reality. And by creating the electronic intifada, I don't think that by that you will bring the right of return right, to the Palestinians. Well, I mean... You know, I live outside the country because my parents were expelled as refugees. I, uh, you know, that, that's my reality. And that's the reality of millions of Palestinians. And I have been to the camps in Lebanon. And would you go I, back to live there? If, what is Israel? You know, what I always say, yes or no? what I say yes to the no? people would you in go the camps back to live there? is if my grandfather... Ali Abunima, would you go back or not? Nobody would no. choose to be in a refugee camp. No, would you nobody go back to choose. live in what is now I don't Israel? Wish, I might do. I don't really yeah. wish anybody know? to live well, in a refugee camp. I don't know because I don't have wish for anybody to well, live in a refugee camp. Basimi, please, let him speak. The, the point, I'm arguing with you. The point is this. The difference between me and somebody living in Shatila or Burj al Barajne in Lebanon or any of the other refugee camps is my grandfather, when he was expelled, he walked that way and their grandfathers walked that way. I'm lucky because of an accident of history, not because I'm better than Basim that I live in Chicago. Now, what, what we have to recognize, the gentleman asked about concrete solutions. You mentioned, I don't mean this to be a plug, but I, I set that out in my book, One Country, a very concrete proposal. But there's another one. We talk about South Africa, that's only one. The other one is Northern Ireland, where we just witnessed in recent days historic images of Ian Paisley and Jerry Adams of Sinn Féin sitting down to form a coalition government. Which has this got, which is has got what to do with the right of return? I'll tell you this. What has it got to do with Yes, it? I'll tell you exactly. It's the political equivalent of the Likud and Hamas forming a government together. All right, okay. And that's where we All should right. look for inspiration. Gentlemen, gentlemen in the fourth row. <laughs> you, sir. My question is for Mr. Pape. Uh, what will happen to the government of Israel if the Palestinians return? Would the Knesset ever allow it? And will they be given the right to vote? Isn't this a dream? Thank well, you. The Knesset doesn't allow Palestinians who got married from both sides of the green line to live in Israel. So I don't expect the Israeli Knesset, which has a majority of Zionist parties, to allow anything to do with the rights of the Palestinians, let alone the right of return. I think that if we get to the point where the right of return is accepted as a basis, it means that ideological racist uh, ideas have been abandoned and you will have a new parliament and you will have a new political system which will allow Jews and Palestinians to share a land which is not very large and cannot be divided, cannot be segregated and this may be a dream, this may be a utopia but it's a, a worthwhile dream given the present situation of occupation, decolonization uh, and dispossession. Okay, since we have a member of the Knesset here, Yossi Bailin, you might like to come in on that. Yeah, of course. I mean, I maybe, unlike some of you, I'm a politician who believes in solutions. I see both people suffering a lot. And I, I, I'm asking myself, what can I do? I mean, to compare Israel to apartheid, with all due respect, is irresponsible. Israel is a democracy. The Arab states It's a former US president who did it. It What's is a, I mean, I, I met him last week and I said to him exactly what I think about it. We owe him a lot as somebody he who helped us. He play. didn't renounce his opinion. Uh, okay, okay. But I believe it is, I mean, there is no racist policy which prevents people to live together, to marry each other, or something like this. The results of occupation are very bad. 
So there is a majority in Israel which is ready to, to get rid of the occupation, which understands what occupation does to us morally, culturally, and, and so on and so forth. To come back to us and to say, well, forget about the Jewish state, which was established by the UN resolution. But if there's a majority, why do they keep electing governments who don't, uh, don't give back any of the land? I'm not sure whether this is the case. I mean, since they're giving up on the Sana Peninsula to giving up on the Gaza uh, Strip. They still control everything that moves in Gaza. Okay, you know that I, as well as I, I do. Believe, I believe that we are not far from an agreement. I think that in the Arab world today there is readiness for it. I believe that in the Israeli public opinion there is a majority, a big majority, for a, an agreement with the Palestinian or the two-state solution. And I believe that by calling names, using the apartheid and whatever, we are just creating a situation in which every side has to defend himself and say, no, I'm not this, I'm not that. All right. It is bad okay. enough without being apartheid. All right, let me just ask, are there any refugees in the audience? Sorry, you're a refugee from? Jordan. From Jordan. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I believe that if I'm, the ma if I'm the last man standing on earth, that believe in this right of returning back to Palestine, I'll still keep fighting for it till the day that I'll die. Good for you. Good for you. No, uh, let, let, let me just ask you why. Huh? Why? Why do you feel it's worth fighting for? Because it's my country. All right. I'm going to take a question from the gentleman up there. You've had your hand up. Yes, you. You talk about the fact that many Palestinians will not return, even if they are granted the right of return. But do you not realize that the right of return is not only the literal right of return, that as a Palestinian refugee living outside of Palestine, it's my only link with my home country? Why are you so neglectful of my identity? If you take away my right of return, I lose my identity. The five million people outside of Palestine lose their identity. You seem to take that... Lately, it's not. It's, it's someone's identity. It's five million people's it's a home country, and you're so neglectful of that. Can you please explain why? Yeah, probably you are believe in identity. I'm a person who believes in dignity. I am seeking much more a dignity rather than identity. And what dignity is it to take away my because home country? Because in dignity, you might have a much better life, never mind which identity you are holding. And I think that this is one of the major problems that we are trying to do in Palestine today, to defend our dignity rather than identity in terms to achieve our independency in our free own Palestinian yes, state. I might, I might get prosperity, I might get peace if I do give up my right of return, but these are all materialistic gains. Don't we, don't we need to look beyond that? See, I didn't come here to convince you or to change your mind or your mind. You can continue fighting for your right to come back. But I am, as a Palestinian, who already fought for the past 60 years, I am really today came here without any energy to continue my fighting against the occupation. Lady, lady in the fifth row up there. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Um, my question is for the panelists speaking against the motion. So if we consider this war not a war um, of two political parties, but a war between two different religions, Islam is a religion of peace, and it teaches um, to forgive your enemies and to forgive people for their mistakes. Now, there are about five to eight million refugee, uh, Palestinian refugees living outside Palestine. If they were to come back into uh, the present Israel, which consists of about 5.8 5 million Israelis, Jewish Israelis and 1.3 million um, Christian and Muslim Palestinians. Do you not think that there's going to be a demographic, a demographic shift and the Jewish state, the only Jewish state in the world, will perish? I think that the whole idea that I think Ali and I support is not to have a religious state, not a Jewish state, not a Muslim state, not a Christian state. A state for all its citizens, the people who live there, the people who used to live there, the people who want to live there. There is enough, enough place for everyone, there is enough space for everyone, and this could be the beginning of a new life, not just the people who live there, but in the Middle East as a whole. I think we should, it's high time we should turn the Palestine issue into a model which is based on the past, where Christian, Muslim, and Jews lived together in the Middle East until colonization began, and pitted one religion against the other instead of sharing the land together.
Answer me. Yeah, my question is how much Ilan Pape is really representing, which percentage he is representing inside Israel. On the other side, specifically to work towards the word demographic. Yasser Arafat on February 3rd, 2002, wrote an article in the New York Times, in the, in the New York Times, and he said, when we the Palestinians talking about the right of return, we should have to take into our consideration the Israeli demographic concerns. What does it mean by Yasser Arafat to take into our consideration the Israeli democratic concerns? Which means that Yasser Arafat clearly, in, a, in other words, would like to tell the Palestinians, forgive from that demand. Um, you, sir, in the, in the middle there. Uh, I'm a third generation Palestinian refugee and uh, like Mr. Abu Nima, I never had to go through all the hardships of, that uh, Mr. Eid has described. And what all the refugees here have said and what Mr. Abu Nima has said is very idealistic and all, but who are we to promote something that might hurt people who actually are in the refugee camps? I, are I not as privileged as we are. I'm not imposing anything on any Palestinian. What I'm saying is that people ought to be given the choice. If you don't want to go back and you want to accept compensation, that's your choice. But we cannot ask people to give up their fundamental human rights so that Israelis can have a racist state in which they are special and okay. better than everyone Yossi else. Bailin. I want to tell you something. Yasser Abedrabo, the former Minister of Culture of the Palestinian government, uh, who was the co-signer of the Geneva Initiative and myself, appeared uh, two years ago in the University of Brussels. It was a, a very a big audience of thousands of people, and many of them were local Jews and local Palestinians. The Palestinians shouted on Yasser Arafat, how come you gave up on the right of return? The Jews shouted on me, how come you gave up on East Jerusalem on, in the temp Temple Mount? And uh, as it, it went on and on and on, we, we felt in the audience their criticism against it. We had to defend the fact that we tried to find a solution in order not to kill each other. And both of them, the Jews who might remain in Brussels, the Palestinians who might remain in Brussels, shouted on us, why did you make peace? And eventually we told them, with all due respect, we don't say anything against you. If you want to live in Brussels, it is fine. We are dying. We are paying the price. We are afraid to take a bus. We are, we are, we are unable to, to cross a checkpoint. We are those who are there for 60 years. So with all due respect, we must make peace between us. Now, if we can't, okay. we can't. But if we can, who are you to tell us don't leave? All right, let me go back to the questioner here. Where, where, where do you stand on this issue? You seem to believe that the right of return is not worth fighting for anymore. Well, I think it's, if there is a chance that giving up the right of return might improve the lives of other Palestinians, then I'm for giving it up. Because although um, it's, it's very idealistic and all, it's, it might be our fundamental right, it might be our dignity and everything. We are not there, like n no one here in the audience tonight lives in a refugee camp. No one has to go through all this pain and suffering. Let me ask you no, a question. Let, let, let him finish, let him finish. Uh, I might be disconnected from Palestinians and from people in the refugees, for refugee camps. I've never been to Palestine. The closest I've been is Jordan. Uh, but I'm not disconnected. I I'm still sensitive to Palestinian suffering. And if there's something that might help and improve their lives, then I'm definitely for it. Ali Abu Nima. Yeah, we would all do whatever we could for peace. But what's the evidence that giving up our rights uh, creates peace on the country. You cannot make... You don't make think there should be compromises? Of course peace. there should be. So that involves giving up rights, Of course there should rights, be. Compromise. The compromise is it's that I have... giving up rights. I have no objection. In fact, I'm very glad that Yossi Balin and his family and his ancestors live in the country. They're there. The compromise is that they live there with us together in peace. The thing I can't understand is why he finds it so horrifying that my mother should live in the country with him. That's the thing I can't understand. 
Do you want to come back on that? Yeah. Okay, firstly, uh, you might have been to refugee camps and spoken to the people who told you that they should fight for the right of return, but as you said, it was in Lebanon. And the only person that I ever met that has lived in refugee camps is Mr. E here tonight, who has just described the terrible conditions of refugee camps. And secondly, you're talking about dignity and idealism and fundamental human rights and everything. But we all know that world is not perfect. And this is about people suffering every day. And uh, like the gentleman here said, he doesn't care about material things and everything, but people who starve do care about material things. And I doubt that they care about anything else. Okay, but Ilan, I don't you. believe either of us. Wait a minute. Go out and talk to the refugees yourself. Don't take okay. my word and don't I take Papi, briefly. I think we should all agree that the refugees themselves, first of all, should be consulted and asked whether they want to return or not. Yes. And we should have a democratic, not, not a survey that Khalil Shkaki did in, yes. in Lebanon, asking people whether they want, be sec whether they want to be second-rate citizens in Israel. Not surprising, only 10% prefer to be second-rate citizens in Israel than continuing to be in the refugee camp. I think that, that we have one clear indication in the occupied territories. The majority of the refugees who live in the occupied territories voted for a government that upholds the right of return. Okay, so the only democratic vote that we had on the right of return ended up with choosing between the two parties, one that is wishy-washy about the right of return and one which is very clear about the right of return. The people under occupation, unlike Bassam Eid, voted for a government okay. that upholds the right of We've return. We've said that. All right. Lady in the fourth row, please. Good evening. My question is to Mr. Abunama. Yes, you, you believe that the Palestinians are going to accept living with Israelis after 60 years of suffering and sacrifices. Isn't this also a method of giving up? Um, your question seemed rather bleak. Do you not believe of the, in the possibility of a, a peace deal based either on the right of return or something else? No, I don't believe that the Palestinians would accept it. And if even they do accept it, I don't believe Palestinians that Palestinians want to live in peace, don't they? They want to live in peace, but they've, suff they've suffered and sacrificed a lot to now accept living with Israel. Why should they? And if they do accept it, you think the Israelis would accept it? So, what, so what is the best option for them, a two-state solution? To carry on fighting. Pasami, <laughs> do you want to answer that? If you are so full of energy, so please welcome to Gaza to help us to help us and to fight with us. If I had the chance to go to Gaza, I would come. Now, on the other side, <laughs> on the other side, I mentioned before, if you are living in a hole, stop digging. So everybody here becomes so emotional towards the issue of the right of return. But emotion is not working in politics and will never deliver any kind of peace between is such kind of two hatred parties, which is the Palestinians and the Israelis. Excuse me, I think that we are the Palestinians, especially in the occupied territories, should have to be much more wiser than anybody else living outside the occupied territories and to start to take an independent decision about our future and our children's future. Lady in the fifth, fourth row there. Uh, my question is uh, for the member of the panel for the motion. Uh, by, you said that by giving up uh, the right of return, we'll have uh, some kind of peace. What's the guarantee that we'll have this peace? If I have to, to give the guarantee, I, I, I want to tell you something. Most of, of the Israelis are criticizing me personally and people like me for having these agreements which were breached. And they believe that they were breached by the Palestinians. The truth is, if I may be objective, is that both sides breached the agreements. The Israelis with the settlements, this was the spirit of the agreement not to continue with them, and the Palestinians with violence, because it was very clear that they gave up on it and they did. The question is what, not about guarantees, because, I mean, it is not that the Palestinians are going to give up on a right and nothing will happen. It is a package in which Israel will withdraw to the 67 borders and divide Jerusalem. And they may ask the same question. What guarantees are we having if the Palestinians who have breached the agreement so many times will now say, you know what, now that we have Jerusalem and we have the whole of the West Bank and Gaza, now we want to return to Israel. So at the end of the day, 
it is not an insurance policy, as we have peace with Egypt and we have peace with Jordan. And in the bottom line, it is respected by both sides. I believe that we can have peace with the Palestinians. And once there is a permanent agreement, I believe that both sides will not have the incentive to breach it. All right. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the point in the proceedings where we're going to vote on the motion that this House believes the Palestinians should give up their full right of return. Please take your voting machines. If you want to vote for the motion, press button one, the yellow button. That is the motion that is supported by Bassam Eid and Yossi Balin. If you want to vote that, it's button one, the yellow button. If you want to vote against the motion, it's button two, the red button, that is supported by Ilan Pape and Ali Abu Nima. That's button two, the red one, you vote against it. Would you do it now? You only have to press the buttons once. Right, we should be getting the vote any second. And there it is, 18.4% 18, 18 for the motion. 81.6% against. The motion has been resoundingly defeated. All it remains for me to do is to thank our distinguished speakers for making the journey here. Thank you, gentlemen, very much indeed. To you, the audience, thanks to you for your questions. The Doha debates will be back again in May, so please do join us then. For now, from all of us on the team, have a safe journey home. Thank you for coming. Good night. Thank you.